Well, hello, everyone. My name is Bob Cook, and I'm an associate professor and extension entomologist with the University of Minnesota. Today, I'd like to talk to you about managing insecticide resistant soybean aphids. So a lot of us across the Midwest are pretty familiar with this pest. Again, it's this small sap sucking insect that uh, can significantly reduce soybean yields if not managed. And we see that it is widespread across a lot of the soybean growing acres in the, um, in the United States. Interestingly, recent research has suggested that outbreaks and infestations of the soybean aphid have decreased in parts of the, uh, the Midwest. However, in Minnesota, parts of the Eastern Dakotas and Northern Iowa, we're still getting pretty consistent outbreaks of the soybean aphid. And just as a quick recap, the situation from Minnesota this last summer, um, infestation levels of the soybean aphid were quite variable across the state and even at smaller scales, even uh, you know, on an individual farm from field to field, there's a lot of variability. And I think that variability is due to the variable planting dates because of uh, early season weather conditions. Um, some folks were able to get their beans in on time. Other folks, unfortunately, had had those significant delays. And from the soybean aphid perspective, early in the season, those early planted fields are more preferred. But later in the season, when soybean aphids become more of a concern, it's often those late planted or late maturing soybean fields that are preferred and get more heavily infested. In addition to that variability in the planting dates, I think a lot of us are well aware that we had pretty variable uh, moisture conditions. And if you look at this map from the US Drought Monitor for Minnesota from uh, later August, you can see that conditions were pretty variable. And what this results to for soybean aphid, or what it results in for soybean aphid, is heavily st drought stressed uh, soybean plants become much less suitable or less preferred for the soybean aphid. So they might move to less stressed areas or populations might, uh, in particular for this year, they were lower in the heavily drought stressed areas and higher in the um, areas that receive some timely rains. In addition to that, in these areas, some of these areas that did end up being favorable because of planting dates and uh, you know getting some timely rains, uh, these later season infestations became challenging. And this is due to the fact of you know when we get into mid to late August, we got a decrease in probability of uh, of getting a yield response or return on investment for some of these insecticide applications, aphids can up and leave to go to buckthorn, which is their overwintering host. So leaving the soybean field and naturally going to buckthorn. And we, all, we also have the complication of the pre-harvest intervals for the insecticides we might need to use to suppress these late season infestations. And then on top of all that, kind of the icing on the cake from a negative perspective was that some growers again experienced pyrethroid resistant soybean aphids complicating or reducing the efficacy of some of their insecticide applications. So that's just a quick recap from this year. Um, you know, if you're from Minnesota, you'd likely experience some of this. Um, from what I've heard from my colleagues in other states, soybean aphid wasn't too much of an issue this year in other areas, but uh, it, it does remain a chronic pest uh, across a fairly broad geography from year to year. Now, when we step back and think about soybean aphid management, a lot of times we talk about, we like to talk about it in terms of integrated pest management, right? So that means bringing together and integrating different management tactics. Ideally, we'd be relying on biological control, which is, you know, predatory insects or parasitic insects. Here we've got a predator, a lady beetle eating a soybean aphid. Um, ideally, we'd be incorporating pest resistant varieties, uh, which is called host plant resistance. We can see an aphid susceptible variety next to an aphid resistant variety and very drastic differences in the number of aphids per leaf here. And then chemical control. So unfortunately for soybean aphid, our integrated pest management programs are still very heavily reliant on chemical control. We're not at a point yet where we're uh, very effectively 
integrating a lot of other tactics. Hopefully that'll change with time and you know continued research, but the resulting complication of this heavy reliance on chemical control has been the development of insecticide resistance. And this shouldn't be you know, a surprise to many folks who are involved in agriculture. We, I think we know quite well that the more we expose a pest, be it an insect, a weed, or a pathogen, to some kind of pesticide, you're very likely, you know, you're you're, you're likely to, you know, increase the chances of, of resistance developing. So thinking about integrated pest management for soybean aphid and utilizing um, the insecticides, you know, one of our key recommendations is is trying to decide. Re they relate to trying to decide when to spray. So we want folks to be out scouting their fields, estimating the number of aphids on plants, and then using a threshold to decide if an insecticide is uh, warranted for a particular field. And our recommendations are still to use the uh, 250 aphids per plant threshold. Our research still supports this as a conservative economic or action threshold for soybean aphid. Uh, keep in mind that this 250 aphids per plant is the trigger point where we want to start lining up an insecticide application so we can prevent the population from reaching higher uh, economically damaging levels. At this point, the aphids are not causing economic losses or yield losses. This is just that point where we're going to proactively knock down the population to prevent those economic problems. So if we get a field, we've scouted it, we've hit that economic threshold, then we want to come in with what we hope is an effective uh, foliar application of an insecticide. And this is where the, the resistance issues are posing challenges for us now, because some of these insecticides that were previously effective are not so effective anymore. So this table shows a list of some of the main insecticide active ingredients that have been available to us for management of the soybean aphid. Um, in this first column, we've got carbamates and organophosphates as a group one insecticides. The group three insecticides are the pyrethroids. And then in group four, we've got the neonicotinoids and some newer chemistries that we'll talk about a little later in my presentation. And then we also have a group nine insecticide that we'll, we'll talk about uh, later in the presentation as one of the newer options for control of the soybean aphid. So what I want to focus on now are the group three insecticides, the pyrethroids. And this is where we've had issues with insecticide resistance. In particular, soybean aphids have developed resistance to the pyrethroid insecticides. Um, to date, we haven't documented that resistance with any of the other uh, insecticide groups here, but it is possible, um, if we're not careful with how we're using these other insecticides, that our soybean aphid populations could potentially develop resistance to other insecticide groups. So um, the pyrethroid insecticides are called sodium channel modulators. And what they do is they work on the insect nervous system. You've got the insect brain up here, and these are the nerves that take messages out to the different parts of the body. And the pyrethroids act on the axon of the cell. So that's like this long stretched out part of the cell. And there are electrical signals that are conducted down the axon to send the messages from the brain to the body parts or from the body parts to the brain. And the pyrethroids mess up that electrical signal and eventually results in death of the insect. So back in 2015, uh, my laboratory was doing uh, resistance monitoring work. We had heard anecdotal reports from consultants in Minnesota that some of the pyrethroid insecticides were not working as well as they had been in the past. Uh, some of that work started in 2013, 2014, but it was in 2015 when we first uh, documented resistance to the pyrethroids. Since then, uh, we documented it you know, each year up to 2021 using these uh, a glass vial bioassay 
where we treat the inside of these glass vials with a concentration of insecticide that should kill 99% of the aphids. And then uh, we put aphids into those vials from different populations and see if they survive. If they're surviving better than expected, that could be an indication that there's resistance. So utilizing methods like this, we documented resistance, like I said, across these years from 2015 to 2021, and from a pretty broad geography spanning Minnesota, um, parts of North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, and Manitoba. And this graph is you know, just a snapshot of one of our data sets where in 2019, we were using the insecticide bifenthrin, which again is a pyrethroid. This LC99 means that we were using a concentration of that insecticide that should kill 99% of the aphids if they're susceptible to the insecticide. And then what we have in the graph is the percent mortality. So the percentage of the aphids that died when they were exposed to that insecticide. And we collected aphids from a bunch of different populations across uh, Minnesota and neighboring states. And the black bar was our laboratory susceptible population. And we see that that insecticide killed just about what we would expect of 99% of those aphids. And some of the populations uh, statistically did not differ from that laboratory susceptible population, indicating that you know a fair number of these populations were still insecticide susceptible or did not have resistance. But when you get down to these populations within this bracket here, where the bars are getting shorter, meaning there's less mortality or more survival, um, that's where we likely have insecticide resistance in these populations. Following up on that, we've been doing quite a bit of work to look at the mechanisms of resistance. I don't have time today to go into the details of that work. But basically what we're trying to do is, is figuring out how it is that these soybean aphids are surviving exposure to the insecticides. And we've uh, got some evidence of two different mechanisms of resistance. One is called target site mutations. And that is basically, uh, it means that there are some mutations um, within the insect where the insecticide molecules are supposed to bind to those uh, those nerve cells, there's some mutations there where the insecticides can't bind anymore and, and do their thing. And we also have some evidence for increased detoxification, meaning that these resistant aphids may have more enzymes in them or more active enzymes that are breaking down the insecticide molecules after they get into the aphids. So I talked about some of the work that we've done in the laboratory, right, using these glass vial bioassays, collecting aphids from the field, putting them in the vials in this really detailed um, laboratory work, trying to figure out these mechanisms of resistance. But that information is it, very important, but it doesn't tell us how well or how poorly these insecticides are working in the field. And that's um, what we call practical resistance. And that's the, the decrease in field efficacy or the decrease in efficacy of field applications of the insecticides. So what we did for this work is we relied on our standard insecticide efficacy trials that extension entomologists like me and others in other states, a lot of us perform every year evaluating new insecticides versus standard insecticides. So what I'm gonna present here is some data that was uh, collected by my lab and the predecessor in my lab, uh, lab uh, Dr. David Regsdale in southeastern Minnesota. And then we've got data from southwestern Minnesota collected by my colleague, Bruce Potter, who is within the University of Minnesota Extension. So here's the data from southeastern Minnesota near the city of Rosemont. And across the bottom of the graph, we see the years from 2005 to 2020. And along the side of the graph, we see percent control. And we've got the data from Lamberton that's in southwestern Minnesota and laid out in a similar way. And now I wanna walk you through um, some of the results of this analysis here. What we see is that from 2005 to 2014, this pyrethroid lambda cyhalothrin that we were applying to our plots, you know, field applications similar to what would be happening on farms, 
Lambda Sahel for containing products were working very well, um, you know, with nearly 100% efficacy, meaning they were, you know, killing almost all the aphids in those plots. However, starting at 2014 or after 2014, at both of these sites, we see a very drastic decrease in the percent control or decrease in the efficacy of these insecticides. So this analysis identifies 2014 as the change point or tipping point, you know, kind of the, the last date or year that the Lambda Sahelzern is working well at these locations. And then we can also quantify how quickly these uh, the efficacy was decreasing. So if we look at Lamberton, the graph on the right, we see that the efficacy was decreasing at about 4% per year. And then we see a much steeper rate of decrease when we look at Rosemont in southeastern Minnesota, where we had nearly a 20% decrease per year. So that much steeper line. And interestingly, this point down here actually has a percent control that's a negative value. So if you stop and think about that, it, it, it may be, seem a little puzzling on the surface, but what that means is that the number of soybean aphids in that experiment in our plots treated with lambda cyhalothrin, the pyrethroid, were actually more or greater than in our untreated plots. So that's kind of a nightmare scenario for a grower. If you know, if you got an aphid infestation, you go out and spray it, and you actually make the problem worse, right? So it's very likely that we had insecticide resistance in those soybean aphids, where some of those aphids could survive. And I'm sure, being a broad spectrum insecticide, we probably killed off some of those beneficial insects, the predators and parasitic wasps. So then, those surviving aphids in that field could then kind of have a free for all and increase their populations without having the, the predatory insects suppressing them. So we talked about the pyrethroid insecticides. Again, that's group three, and those are the pyrethroids. Again, um, so right now, as is, we're currently not recommending the pyrethroids as kind of standalone first applications for management of this pest. And that's because we have for numerous multiple years across a broad geography documented resistance in this pest. It doesn't mean that all populations of soybean aphid are resistant, but we've been seeing it every year and frequently enough where we're really hesitant to recommend the pyrethroid insecticides by themselves for a first application against um, soybean aphid. It's unfortunate because the pyrethroids were kind of standby insecticides, something we used quite often for management of soybean aphid populations. So if we think about our, our IPM toolbox or our chemical toolbox for managing this pest, you know, we've kind of reduced or almost removed one important tool, the pyrethroids. Another very important tool, chemical tool that we've used for soybean aphid management is one of the organophosphates called chlorpyrifos. So this insecticide is in products like Lorsvan, some of the generics and some uh, formulated mixtures. So I've got that highlighted here because it's the next one I wanna talk about. And in addition to that, I've got a line through it because we no longer have access to chlorpyrifos. So not only are we kind of essentially losing access to the pyrethroids due to resistance, uh, we've lost access to chlorpyrifos due to regulatory actions. So what happened here is recently uh, in February of this year, the US EPA has revoked tolerances for chlorpyrifos, meaning that we can no longer use chlorpyrifos containing products on food and feed crops. Um, I'd encourage you to check with your local state regulatory officials if you have uh, excess product and you need disposal options. Um, my understanding in from conversations with the regulatory folks in Minnesota is that if you have stocks or you know product on your shelves that contains chlorpyrifos, just because you have it, you cannot use it. So um, that's reduced. That chemical toolbox for us, again, 
um, unfortunately, chlorpyrifos was a very effective insecticide for managing this pest. If we look back at some of our historic data, like I showed for the pyrethroids, you'll see that even though for the pyrethroids at 2014, we had that drastic decrease in efficacy for chlorpyrifos, um, over that time, we maintained high levels of efficacy. So it's unfortunate from a pest management perspective that chlorpyrifos um, was lost. However, we fortunately have some newer insecticides available to us now for management of soybean aphid infestations. Uh, the first two that I want to talk about are group four insecticides. And this is that group that has the neonicotinoid insecticides. The two active ingredients are sulfoxiflor, which is the active ingredient in uh, a product like Transform, and flupyrodiferone, which is the active ingredient in uh, Sivanto products. So what these group four insecticides do, they act on the insect nervous system. So kind of like the pyrethroids, they're messing with the nervous system of the insects, but they do it in a different way. If you remember in that diagram that I showed before for the pyrethroids, the pyrethroids act on the axon of the nerve cells, that long stretched out part of the nerve cell where you get the electrical signal being conducted. The group four insecticides, neonicotinoids, um, sulfoxiflor, and flupyrodiferone, they work at this junction or the synapse, the area where the two different nerve cells come together. And it's a chemical message that goes from one cell to the next. And that chemical message is, um, is it's, it's carried out through what we call neurotransmitters. And here's kind of a cartoon diagram of that where one cell, you get the electrical signal coming down. It causes the cell to release this chemical message. And then that chemical message attaches to receptors on the next cell, which passes the message on. So the, the group four insecticides are messing with this process by binding to these receptors and not letting the, uh, the cell's chemical message do its thing. The other insecticide group or insecticide that's uh, relatively newly available to us now is in group nine. And these are called cortitonal organ, organ modulators. The name of this active ingredient is a, a phytopyrifin. So it's uh, the product would be uh, Sephina. And I think there are some formulated mixtures now. But these products in the pyropenes, you know, so like Sephina, they act a little bit differently in killing the insects compared to some of these other products. Remember the pyrethroids and organophosphates and the, actually the neonicotinoids or other group fours are working on the nervous system of the insects. These pyropenes, the group nine insecticides, are working on these cortitonal stretch receptors, which are in this cartoon diagram depicted by these red dots. So these are little stretch receptors that occur in the articulations or joints of the insect. So in the joints of the legs, the antennae, the wings. So anywhere the insect body is bending, they've got little stretch receptors there that tell their insect brains how their bodies are oriented. And if these insects are exposed to uh, insecticides like this, it affects or modulates how those stretch receptors are working, resulting in the insects becoming disoriented. They no longer know um, how, their, how their body parts are oriented. They'll stop feeding um, nearly immediately and they'll eventually die from starvation and desiccation. So these cortitonal organ modulators, so group nine insecticides, stop feeding nearly immediately, but they result in a slower death. Um, one of my students was doing some laboratory greenhouse work, and she described it as like little zombie aphids that were still present on the plants, not feeding, and they're just kind of waiting to die a slow death. Um, I think it's important to note that aphids that are not feeding are essentially as good as dead aphids. I've got some data 
to show from a greenhouse experiment where we used small potted plants to show how some of these newer products are stacking up in efficacy. On this graph, we used, um, we had an untreated treatment. We had a phytopyropin, which is Safina, blue pyridiferone, which is Savanto, sulfoxiflor, which is Transform. And then we had the pyrethroid lambda uh, you know, which would be a, a product like Warrior. So you can see those product names over here. We got the untreated. We sprayed the plants when they had about 80 or so aphids uh, per plant. And then we monitored the aphid numbers for about a week after that treatment. And what we saw was that the untreated plants, not surprisingly, the aphid populations increased and increased quite rapidly. On the plants treated with Transform, Warrior, and Savanto, the aphid populations decreased very rapidly and were statistically different from the uh, untreated plants. That's what these blue circle, circles or opals mean within a date, is, you know, which treatments differed from each other. And this middle line, this is for Safina. So again, that's that group nine insecticide. And we can see that, um, that these aphids are dying slower, right? So we had intermediate numbers of aphids at one in two days compared to the control and these other insecticides. But by the time we got out to five days, um, Safina was as effective as these other insecticides. But keep in mind, these are those little zombie aphids kind of wandering around on the plants, but not feeding. And again, in my mind, aphids that are not feeding are as good as dead aphids. So I think there's going to be a learning curve there for folks using uh, Safina or a Phytopyrifin containing products, because after an application, you might still see some aphids there. Um, but I think you just need to accept the fact that, that those aphids are not feeding and they will die off very soon. So that was a greenhouse study using potted plants. Um, granted, you know, that's a fairly artificial environment, but we like to start some of our research that way. But we always like to follow it up with uh, field efficacy trials to get more realistic conditions. So what I'm going to do now is share with you some uh, snapshots of different insecticide efficacy trials that we've conducted over the years, um, where we've included some of these newer insecticides along with some of the standby insecticides like the pyrethroids. So on this graph, or these data, were collected in Lamberton, Minnesota in 2016 by my colleague, Bruce Potter, and we published this data all together in a, in a paper in 2019. Across the bottom of the graph, we've got the date, the sample dates. Uh, the arrow indicates when the insecticides were applied. And on the side of the graph, we have cumulative aphid days. And that's that it's a measure of aphid abundance integrated over time. So it's not only the number of aphids that are there, but it's how long the aphids are there. And it's, it's actually kind of like um, growing degree days and how those accumulate over the season aphid abundance or pressure accumulates over this season. So in this trial, the, uh, the dotted line is from the untreated plots. And we see that the treated plots with Transform, Safina, or Warrior all perform similarly and very effectively. Um, the circles indicate that these three insecticides did not differ from one another. And they did differ statistically from the untreated. So the two newer insecticides, epidopyrifin and sulfoxiflor, were working just as well as lambocyhalothrin in a field where we did not have pyrethroid resistance. Here's a trial, again, from Bruce Potter in Lamberton, Minnesota, so that's southwestern Minnesota in 2017. The graph is set up similarly with data across the bottom cumulative aphid days across the side of the graph. And the, uh, the dotted line, again, represents our untreated plots, no insecticide applied. And then we've got three different insecticides here, Lorsban or chlorpyrifos, so that's the organophosphate that, was, uh, that we can no longer use due to the regulatory action. We included Safina, 
and warrior. And what we see is that these three insecticide treatments did not differ from each other, but all three of those perform better than the untreated plots. So here's Safina, who are working just as well as kind of the old standbys, Lord Van and Warrior, for a trial where we very likely did not have insecticide resistance in this population. Now, if we go a little farther south to Sutherland, Iowa, uh, my colleague at Iowa State, Aaron Hodson, performed this trial, and we included these data in that publication that I mentioned from 2019. Um, the graph is set up in the same fashion. However, we have more insecticides included here. We've got untreated plots. We've got, again, ifidopyropin, which is um, Safina, flupyrodifferone, which is Sabanto. We've got uh, sulfoxiflor, which is Transform, Lambdacyhalothrin, which is Warrior, and Chlorpyrifos, which is Lors Band. So I've got all those product names on the side here to try to facilitate understanding. And similar to what we're seeing with some of the Minnesota data, these insecticides were all performing well and equally well. They did not differ from one another, but they were all um, had higher levels of control or lower abundance of aphids, lower cumulative aphid days than the untreated plots. So in this experiment, we had no evidence of insecticide resistance. Warrior was still performing or no evidence of pyrethroid resistance because Warrior was still performing well. However, in Nashua, Iowa, in 2017, this was another one of Dr. Aaron Hodson's trials set up similarly. This time we see a population that very likely had pyrethroid resistance. We see an intermediate level of control offered by Warrior. So if you look at the graph, the cumulative aphid days for Warrior, again, the pyrethroid lambda cyhalothrin did not differ from these other insecticides and it did not differ from the untreated. So it, it had intermediate performance. Um, if it was a susceptible population that uh, control should have been much better, meaning, you know, the, the numbers should have been much lower, like we saw for these other insecticides. So what this, what these data tell me is that in a field with pyrethroid resistant soybean aphids, these other newer products are performing well, suggesting that there's very likely no cross resistance yet between Warrior and the newer products like Sifina, Sabanto, and Transform. Now, if we come back up to Minnesota and southeastern Minnesota this time near the city of Rosemont, I've got a couple of my trials included. Um, again, these are kind of standard insecticide efficacy trials. In this first experiment, um, we had an untreated check. We had Warrior, which is the pyrethroid lambda cyhalothrin. We've got Endigo, which is a mixture of pyrethroid and neonicotinoid. Argyle is a different mixture of uh, pyrethroid and neonicotinoid. And then we've got Sivanto, which is one of the newer group four insecticides, and Safina, which is that group nine insecticide that's newer. So these two columns that popped up now, those are the mean number of aphids per plant. For these two sample dates. And I use some color coding to show the differences among these treatments, where we see that the untreated check had very high numbers of aphids on that first sample date. And those numbers were um, significantly higher than that of uh, all the insecticides. But Warrior had, a, had an intermediate density of aphids, meaning that it's, it's the control offered was intermediate. So kind of like that experiment that we saw in Iowa, where we very likely had also had some pyrethroid resistance in this population. So again, it's promising to see that these other insecticides are performing well, despite the fact that the uh, pyrethroid by itself was not performing well. And at the later sample date, we see that the uh, abundance of aphids in the warrior treated plots was actually statistically similar to that in the untreated and the endigo treated plots. So that's lambda cyhalothrin and a neonicotinoid mixed together. Um, 
those numbers did not differ from the untreated check as well. Uh, this may be some evidence that this formulated mixture of lambda cihalothrin with a neonic um, may be, uh, the efficacy may be decreasing due to uh, uh, pyrethroid resistance, but we do need further research into that. So we've got another experiment at Rosemont from 2019. Um, the data are laid out similarly here. We've got some different treatments. Uh, we've got the pyrethroid lambda cihalothrin or warrior. We've got Endigo, which is that formulated mixture of the pyrethroid lambda cihalothrin along with a neonicotinoid, thiamethoxam, and a couple different formulations and rates of that. Argyle, which is a different mixture of a uh, pyrethroid and neonicotinoid. And again, Safina, that newer group nine insecticide. And the results we see here are fairly similar to what we saw the previous year, where uh, most of the insecticides provided um, good control of the aphids, uh, with numbers of aphids being significantly less than the untreated plot. Warrior, again, provided an intermediate level of control. In this case, the number of aphids per plant actually statistically was not different from that in the untreated. That's why those are all in red. What we see in the orange here is uh, some of the endigo treatments. So again, that's that mixture of the pyrethroid with the neonicotinoid. Um, somewhat intermediate values there, slightly um, less effective control than some of the other treatments. And again, that could be some evidence that the control offered by a product like this may be slipping a bit um, with pyrethroid resistance in the system, but that's something where we really need to do some more thorough detailed research to uh, understand what's going on there. So another important aspect of the insecticides that we're using for soybean aphid or really any crop pest is its spectrum of control, right? We want to use insecticides that are going to do a good job killing the pests. And I showed you that these newer insecticides are doing a good job doing that. So floor here, um, which is a, the active ingredient in a product like Transform, I showed you that that did a good job killing the soybean aphids. But in kind of an added feature of some of these newer products is that they're more selective than some of the traditional broad spectrum insecticides. So if you think about the organophosphates and pyrethroids, they do a good job killing the pests, but they also do a good job killing a lot of the natural enemies or good insects in the fields. So a selective insecticide is something that does a good job killing the pests, but it's much less toxic to the predators and other natural enemies. Uh, so it kind of selectively kills the pests and leaves the predatory or beneficial insects surviving. And we did some assays with Transform compared to Warrior, the pyrethroid. And then there was a, another product, Seeker, which was a mixture of essentially Transform and the pyrethroid. And we looked at impacts of Transform and these other insecticides to some of these common predators of the soybean aphid. And what we saw is that for the lady beetle or ladybug, um, Transform was relatively non-toxic to this pest. We see the, the survival of the lady beetle here when it was treated with Transform being very similar, statistically similar to that of untreated beetles. However, if beetles were treated with the pyrethroid, uh, lambda cihalothrin through warrior or through that mixture with seeker, we see those beetles died off very fast. It was very toxic to them. This is a lacewing larva. Uh, they're predatory on aphids. And we see a similar pattern here, but overall um, warrior and seeker were somewhat less toxic to the, um, to the lacewing larvae. However, um, they, they were statistically more toxic than the untreated treatment. But if we look at transform, so again, that sulfoxaflor, um, that was relatively non-toxic and the numbers surviving did not differ from that in the untreated control. 
And kind of the final important predator that we looked at is a minute pirate bug. Um, and we see um, somewhat different results. The top line here is the survival of this predator in untreated um, scenarios, no exposure to insecticides, whereas these other lines represent the insecticide treatments. The bottom two are when the insects are exposed to the pyrethroid lambasi halothrin, either by itself or in combination. And this intermediate line is for transform. So we see that, you know, transform was toxic to this predator, but somewhat less so, at least early on, compared to these other insecticides. So this is some evidence to indicate that, you know, some of these newer products, again, like sulfoxiflor or transform, are more selective, meaning they're still good at killing the aphids, but they are more gentle on some of the natural enemies. And we've got some data as well with a phytopyrifin, that group nine insecticide, that's uh, you know products like Safina. The graphs are presented a little bit differently here. We're using bar graphs instead of the line graphs, but we've got a lady beetle adult, a lady beetle larva. So this is a baby, baby lady beetle. We've got that predatory bug again, the minute pirate bug, and we've got uh, the tiny parasitic wasps that attack the swimming aphid. And in each of these graphs, the first bar represents the survival of these predators with no exposure to insecticides. So these are the untreated controls. The second bar represents survival when they're exposed to a phytopyrifin or saphena. And then the third bar is if they're exposed to lambdaci halothrin. So again, a product like uh, Warrior, the pyrethroid. And what we see for the lady beetles and the minute pirate bug is that survival when they were exposed to a fit of pyrophen or safina was the same as if they were exposed, if they were not exposed to insecticides. So pretty clearly showing that selectivity, they're, they're not toxic or they're um, relatively less toxic than the, uh, they're relatively less toxic to the natural enemy. Um, however, with lambda cy health or in the pyrethroid, we see significant decreases in survival, suggesting that higher toxicity. And then for the tiny parasitic wasp, um, we got a significant reduction in survival when exposed to a phytopyrifin or safina. Um, an inter intermediate uh, level of survival, but it did not knock the survival down as greatly as when they were exposed to lambdocyhalothrin. So exposure to lambdocyhalothrin killed all these wasps. Um, exposure to safina, aphidopyrifin, um, killed off some of them. But it, it, it was, again, some evidence of this product being uh, relatively selective or less toxic to these natural enemies. So getting close to wrapping this up here, we uh, have seen that we've got pyrethroid resistance. We've got uh, lost access to one of the uh, organophosphate insecticides. We've got some newer chemical tools available to us. And I guess I'm asking that farmers and their um, agricultural advisors and other uh, agricultural professionals that, that we really consider insecticide resistance management. We've got some tools that are still working for us and we need to protect these tools. One important way to do that is through insecticide resistance management. So some key steps for this are only spraying when we need to spray. So to do that, we need to be out there scouting our fields and using thresholds. If we spray, we wanna make sure we're doing it right using the uh, proper rates, labeled rates, um, proper volumes and pressure, proper nozzles. We want to scout our fields after we spray to see if our applications have been effective. We can no longer just assume that if we spray a soybean aphid population that we're going to get the control that we used to get. So we want to be out there scouting again after three to five days to determine if we need to make another application. If we do need to make another application to a field, either because we had a failure due to resistance or some other reason, or we get recolonization, we wanna make sure we're alternating to different insecticide groups. 
So if you make your first application against soybean aphid or some other pest with one insecticide group, if you have to come back in, spray that same infestation, uh, you want you want to switch to a different insecticide group. So in summary, soybean aphid management, we talk a lot about integrated pest management, but it still heavily relies on insecticides. We encourage you to continue using the threshold at 250 aphids per plant, also with the majority of the plants infested and aphid populations increasing as your trigger point to determine when to spray. Um, note that we have widespread pyrethroid resistance. We've documented it over multiple states, multiple years. We fortunately do have some newer chemistries that are available. These chemistries have proven effective against soybean aphid, and they've got the added benefit of being selective, meaning they're less toxic to some of the predatory insects or other beneficial insects out there. So these are some of the products containing, uh, again, Transform, uh, Transform, Sabanto, and Sifina. And finally, to protect these insecticides or these chemical tools, we need to keep in mind insecticide resistance management. So with that, I'd like to wrap up the presentation. I thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, you can contact me at my email address here. Thank you.